Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. The portion of God's Word will look at in detail as the Gospel for the day from St. Luke chapter 3. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. What would the month of December sound like? Maybe you think of a big choir singing Handel's Messiah. Maybe you think of King Crosby crooning, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Maybe you think of Jimmy Fallon and some other guys playing little kids' percussion instruments while Mariah Carey sings All I Want for Christmas is You. Is that what December sounds like? <coughs> How about jackhammers? How about moving equipment, a gravel truck, bulldozers, and a foreman trying to shout over all the din, trying to shout his orders to the construction crew? How about road construction? Is that what December sounds like? In our Gospel today, St. Luke writes about preparing, preparing for Jesus coming to earth. And it sounds noisy. He talks about knocking down mountains, filling in valleys. Prepare the way, that's literally what John said, but let's paraphrase it this morning. Pave the way. Pave the way for the Lord. God's word comes through his ministers. And that word calls for major construction in our hearts. There is, of course, plenty of noise going on all around us in our world, especially, especially at this time of year. We hear the Christmas songs. We hear them at stores. We hear them on the radio. We hear them at our friends' homes. The roads are much busier than they used to be. And kids just seem to be full of even more energy than they have the rest of the year at this time. And none of that is bad. But all of this noise, all of this busyness can be a distraction from what's really important to our lives. There was plenty of noise at the time of John the Baptist. Luke mentioned some of the most important people. We can stop and think about what they were doing. Tiberius Caesar, he was the king, the emperor. And he was busy, among other things, building. He was building roads, roads in Rome and outside of Rome. Herod Antipas and Philip, they governed parts of the country of Israel, a country that had been ruled by their father, Herod the Great, who was known as one of the greatest builders of all time. Most prominently, he had rebuilt an expanded temple there in Jerusalem. Governor Pilate, he wasn't a builder, but he had plenty of other things keeping him busy trying to keep the Jews from revolting against the rule of the Roman Empire in that area. You know, it's actually kind of interesting that none of these people were mentioned. Pilate, Herod, and Zacchaeus would all come face to face with Jesus, and yet none of them would be prepared. And to all this cacophony, the word of God came to John. John had been the miraculous child of priest Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, after years, after decades of praying, God had provided them with a child, but John was so much more than that. God called John to be his messenger. You see, God had some news, some earth-shaking news that he wanted to bring here upon this busy, busy world. God called John to go, to go into the wilderness outside of Jerusalem, to go off-road in the countryside along the river there, the River Jordan. There was a path nearby. There was some traffic, but not a whole lot of business. And this was intentional. God wanted those people who were going to listen to John to leave behind all the busyness, leave behind all the noise, and go outside and actually listen to what God's messenger had to say. There was back in Jerusalem that splendid temple where John could have been working where the sacrifices that God had told them to do were being held. That's where they had the altars and the priests and the musicians and choirs, even the offering plates were there. God had told them how to build that temple. He told them how to run their worship. But the history of the Jews was that so often, even these wonderful things that God had provided became distractions. Even these good things there at church prevented them from listening to God because they got so caught up in ritual and their minds, unfortunately, went away from what God had to say. They weren't ready for the coming of Christ. 
The Bible tells us that years later, when Jesus himself came to the temple, the religious leaders even didn't recognize him there. John was the son of a priest, but he didn't work at the temple. John didn't wear fancy clothes or live in a huge mansion. You remember he wore camel's hair there, that's what his clothes were made out of. He was out there in the wilderness, but he had all he needed for his ministry. He had some water in the river, and he had the word of God. John was the one that Isaiah had prophesied about 700 years earlier. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. John has been compared to a master of ceremonies. You know, he's, he's the guy who prepares people for the main speaker. He, he's the one who stops and tells people about this person, the center of attraction, so that when the star actually comes out there, you know all about him. You have a much better appreciation of what he's going to actually say and do. That's what John got to do. He had the privilege of introducing Jesus to this very busy world. And what a wonderful message he had to proclaim. As Isaiah said, all people will see God's salvation. We live in a world that's very busy. And it's so easy for us to get caught up in the things of this world. And things that aren't even bad, the good things. Even things at church that might keep us so busy that we don't stop and listen. We're not actually fully prepared for Jesus. Fortunately, God today continues to send his messengers. Like John, he continues to send his messengers and the people he calls into his ministry. God sends pastors to us. And as we heard from our reading from 1 Corinthians, the main task for a pastor is to be faithful in proclaiming God's word. That's what really counts for us. As a church, we want to do everything the best we can, of course. We want things to be as beautiful as possible. But in the end, it doesn't matter how fancy, how big, or how beautiful it may be. What matters is, do we have the Word of God? As Paul wrote, do not go beyond what is written in Scripture. And that message of God, what is that message? It comes down to what John had to say. Pave the way. The Word of God, it comes to us through His ministers. And that Word calls for some major construction. Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for Him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth. When we talk about the work of preparing for Jesus, it isn't enough for us just to look beyond a few unimportant things. It isn't enough for us just to put aside the distractions of all the extra music, or not say that we have to go to every last store to try to find every last gift of Jesus Christ. This is serious work. This is important work for us. And sometimes we have to put aside some other important things so that we can concentrate on being prepared for Jesus to come into our hearts. Like maybe I have to stop for a while thinking about my retirement. Maybe I have to stop getting involved in all this busy things that are going on there at work. Maybe I have to stop those emails, just put them aside for a while, not worry about them. Somehow we just have to put aside that busyness. The crowds in Judea, they had to walk outside of Jerusalem to hear what John had to say. Certainly we can put aside the busyness of our lives for a little bit each day so that we can listen to the Word of God. Every valley, Isaiah said, shall be filled in. Every mountain and hill made low. This is serious work. God is talking about major changes to your life. Those things that you haven't done according to His will, when you weren't so nice to other people, when you ignored the needs of others around you, or when you just ignored what God had to say, those are valleys that need to be filled in. And the mountains of sin, those are things that you can't just overlook. You can't just pretend they aren't there, like a magician, you know, using his mirrors to try to hide something. No, we can't continue to hide those things because our sin is a stinking rotten mess, and it prevents Jesus from coming into our hearts. That mountain of sin, it has to be leveled. And that's exactly why God sends his ministers. John went out into the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
Let's talk about the word repentance first of all. Repentance means that you're not going to make any more excuses. You know, it's true that many of the bad things we do are things that we picked up from somebody else. You may have learned to make fun of other people because you listen to your friends. You may have learned to curse from TV. You may have learned to get angry at certain situations because your parents were that way. But it doesn't matter. You still have to take responsibility for what you have done. These are your sins. It doesn't matter. We have to confess them because of what we've done. And repenting doesn't just mean grudgingly saying, okay, I'm sorry. And it doesn't just mean saying, okay, I'm sorry. Jesus would come into this world at a very stressed, very busy time, but he wouldn't let that distract him. Jesus would go around this world helping out people. He would forgive and love even the unlovable people. He would show kindness and mercy to the people that everybody else just wanted to push out of the way. And after demonstrating all this love, keeping all these commandments for us perfectly, Jesus would take our sins and pay the price for them as he made his way to the cross and gave up his life for each one of us so that we would have forgiveness, so that we would have life. John didn't just preach about this. He pointed people to Jesus. But as we read, he also got to baptize. Baptize for the forgiveness of sins. For it's in holy baptism that God personally gives you this assurance of your forgiveness. Something that you can hold on to for the rest of your life. There was a young boy, about six years old. And as he was getting older, he was starting to get down the idea of death. And also the concept of hell. And he was pretty concerned. He was worried because he knew he did some naughty things. And at night, he'd have a hard time going to sleep because he was worrying what, what if he would die at this time. And his parents, Christian parents, talked to him, and they kept assuring him that it was all right. God loved him. God forgave him. Finally, his dad went out of the files and, and pulled out his baptism certificate, brought that to his son, and showed him. He says, see, it says right here, you were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That means that all of your sins have been washed away. That means that you are a child of God. You are forgiven of everything, and heaven is your home. Here, we'll keep this baptismal certificate out, he said, so that when you are afraid, you can look at that once again. You can even touch it if you want to. And that's a reminder that God worked in your life. God really has poured his forgiveness into your heart. Eventually, that boy got over his fears as he remembered what the Lord Jesus had done for him. You see, dealing with our sin is a very serious business. But God's forgiveness is complete. And it is made absolutely real for us in holy baptism. And it is made real for us once again when we stop each day and confess our sins. And we're assured by God that our sins, even those ones that bother us, are wiped out. It's made real for us again when we receive the body and blood of Christ and paid for our sins when we receive that holy communion. If we are going to be prepared for Jesus, then there's some major work that has to be done. But that's exactly what our God does, through His Word and through His sacraments. Someone once suggested that a good picture to describe our lives in this busy, busy world is that person who's out driving and he gets lost, and he just keeps on driving. He's not going to stop for directions, no way whatsoever. That describes us too so often. We get caught up in one loop after another. The world gives us plenty of ways to get distracted in our thinking. There is no way that we're going to get back to actually understanding what God has to say, except that God sends His messengers to us. God gives us His Word through His ministers, who tell us this basic same message that John had to proclaim, this wonderful message that we need to prepare. We need to be prepared by hearing God's Word, by remembering His working in our lives so that we are ready for Jesus to come into our hearts. Prepare the way for the Lord. That voice rings out even today through God's ministers as we listen, as we faithful members stop and hear what our God has to say. Pave the way. The Word of God comes to us through his ministers. That Word of God calls for some very serious work, some serious construction as God reconstructs your life in the image of Jesus your Savior. That's what this Advent season is all about. 
preparing not just for celebrating Christmas, but preparing for Jesus to be in our hearts every day for eternity. God bless you through his gospel. Amen.